The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. last night who enjoyed what you heard last night me too I especially enjoyed hearing again about white white vinegar cleaning mold because I'd heard that a long time ago <laughs> and hearing that um, was it bleach you should never put bleach on mold and I wouldn't have really thought about that so I'm glad I know that and I've been reminded that white vinegar is a good thing to use on mold now, I'll just ask Barbara to come up. Now, there is some new faces that weren't here last night, so we'll just have a quick little recap. Barbara, who are you? Um, oh, I've got one. <laughs> um, my name is Barbara O'Neill, and I'm married to Michael O'Neill, and Michael and I run a health retreat uh, just one hour west of Kempsey. Kempsey is exactly halfway between Sydney and Brisbane um, on the east coast of Australia. And we have 450 acres. We've bought a, uh, an Aboriginal boarding school that had gone into receivership. So we've got a lot of buildings and it's in a beautiful area. And people come to our health retreat for either one or two week programs. They go through a, a detox, couple of days of juices and then uh, um, vegetarian food, they have massages and uh, steam baths every afternoon, so there's a variety of things that we do. And how long have you been there? Uh, we've been in that area for I think about 15 years now and before that we ran a health retreat in Melbourne for five years. And then before that my husband was the business manager at a health retreat in Queensland. Michael and I have been married for 18 years so he was the business manager at that health retreat uh, before we married and for one year after we married and then after a year he said I would like to start my own health retreat and there was a place in Melbourne that asked him to do that and I said who will be your health director he said <laughs> you I said oh no no I'm just a mother that helps other mothers he said you'll be good and he left the room that was it <laughs> so I um with great fear and trepidation, I began, I think my lectures were very, very simple back then. And I think the best way to learn is to teach. <laughs> well, it seems to have been going all right for you. So, yes. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of questions, but before that, um, afterwards tonight, we're gonna have some nice cool water with some minted water, I think it is. Minted water, so um, hang around and get rehydrated. Um, and there's also some books and DVDs out there that you might be interested in, so take a look at them. Um, there was a couple of questions from last night. If you have questions, the question box is out the back too, so you can put your questions out there for us. Um, the two questions that came from yesterday was, does sugar cause type 2 diabetes? That's a very good question and I'll be answering it in the lecture this evening. <laughs> but it has a big contributing effect. And our second question was, what causes fluid retention, especially in the legs? Believe it or not, I'm covering that tomorrow night when I look at heart health. Because when I look at heart health, I'll be talking about water and salt. And fluid retention is all about the kidneys and water and salt. And so I'll be covering that tomorrow night. OK, so if they ask that question, they'll just have to come tomorrow night as well. <laughs> All right, over to you. Thank you. Um, the beauty of the lectures is I'm able to uh, cover it in detail. There's an old proverb, it's Proverbs 14 verse 6 that says, knowledge is easy to him that understands. And that's one of my favourite proverbs because when you understand how the body works, when you understand the functions of the body, then you automatically have the knowledge on how to treat the body. 
Now, before we begin, it is my habit, I, I ask God to come and teach us. So please bow your heads for a moment. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this body. Thank you for this opportunity to look at it, to discuss it, and learn more about it. I pray that you'll help us to understand these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of tonight's lecture is Diabetes and Weight Loss. And Diabetes has some specifics and weight loss has some specifics. But with diabetes and weight loss, there's a loss, there's a lot of areas where there's certainly some common denominators. Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And food plays a major role in diabetes and food plays a major role in weight loss. What I'd like to begin with is, having an, is, is doing an assessment on what most people eat. And I would like to suggest that most people in the developed countries today are huge carbohydrate consumers. Never in the history of man have human beings consumed so many carbohydrates. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin with a carbohydrate assessment list. Question, what would most New Zealanders and Australians have had for breakfast this morning? Cereal. Cereal. We know it's popular because there's a whole aisle devoted to it in the supermarket. And we know it's popular because unfortunately, a lot of people today are on the screens till late. They go to bed too late. They wake up too late. They're in a big hurry. They've got to get to work. Cereal, pour it into the bowl, pour milk on it, goes like wet tissue paper, down the hatch in 10 minutes, out the door. Can you see why it's a very popular food? When I said in one meeting that I gave, what do most Aussies have for breakfast? And one lady said, bacon and eggs. I said, not anymore. <laughs> no one cooks. Well, hardly anyone cooks. Another is toast, so bread. And we know bread's popular because there's a whole aisle devoted to that. And then mid-morning, you see, because these two don't take a person very far, what are they wanting to do mid-morning? And we went past a shop this morning and it had lots of big cakes in the window and I looked in and it was packed. <laughs> so people then will go to the morning teas, yeah? Cakes, biscuits, ex so we'll say cakes, etc., donuts, and another... Uh, Th food that Australians love, and I think Kiwis too, pie. I know in Australia there's even a song about it, meat pies, kangaroos and holden cars, yeah, something like that. And Europeans have introduced Aussies to another fast food called pizza, another fast food, high carb, and pasta. I didn't know what pasta was till I was about 18. I'm a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent. We had sausages ma or chops, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans every single night of the week, except for Sunday, roast lamb. And everyone I knew ate like that, all my neighbours, all my relatives ate like that. I thought everyone in the world ate like that. But when I was about 18, I was introduced to pasta. And Asians have introduced Aussies to rice. I don't think I ate rice till I was in my late teens. And my husband's an Irishman, so every main meal must contain potatoes. And then last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallised acid that's extracted from the sugar cane plant, and that is sugar. Would you agree with me? Aussies, New Zealanders are high carbohydrate consumers. Now what I want to do is I want to take you inside the CBD. Do you remember the CBD? We looked at it briefly last night. The central business district of the human body is the inside workings of the cell. You see, all of these foods break down in the gastrointestinal tract to a singular molecular structure called glucose. And glucose is then absorbed into the blood and then it becomes part of the body because the blood is the life of the flesh. Now the blood takes that glucose on the M1 main highway, portal vein, straight to the project manager. That's the liver. 
Now the liver as the project manager is orchestrating what happens to everything that comes into the body. And so the liver first of all sends the glucose to the cell. So let's have a look at what happens inside the cell. So the glucose comes inside the cell under the action of insulin. Insulin's basically the key that unlocks the door to get the glucose inside the cell. And then it goes through a 20-step pathway. And that 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. Isn't that why we eat? To get energy so our eyes see, so our ears hear, so our brain works, so our heart beats, so every single cell in the body is running because of the glucose. At the end result of this 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because this eight-step pathway gives us th a whopping 36 units of energy. Wow, what a difference. Now that pathway there is an oxygen pathway. It uses oxygen. This pathway uses no oxygen. What a difference oxygen makes. By the way, just a little sideline here. How are you going to feel if every single one of your 100 trillion cells has enough oxygen to get to that eight-step pathway? How are you going to feel? <sighs> We're not going to be able to hold you down. <laughs> How many people today do you know when you say, how do you feel, say, oh, all right, not too bad. What's not too bad? Not too good. You know how it is, getting there. How many people when you say, how are you, say, fantastic. You'd almost say, oh, what's wrong with them? <laughs> oxygen is a very powerful thing, it's oxygen. I have to hold myself back here because we're not talking about oxygen right now. We're talking about glucose. But that, the oxygen explains why so much more energy. So that's the first place that the liver will send the glucose is down the pathway to give us energy. So number one, that is where the glucose goes to the cell. But only so much glucose can be fed through the pathway. And so now the liver causes some to be stored in the muscle cell particularly, like a little bunch of grapes, but they're little molecules of glucose, and they're called glycogen. So glycogen is your quick release glucose stores. So yesterday, I had, I had a, a light soup at about half past four, I think. Then I worked hard, hard yesterday evening, lecturing to you. I got to bed about 10, I think I was in bed by 10. Slept in a little bit, my habit is I wake at five, but you know, five here uh, at the moment is, uh, well, yes, yes. 3 a.m., yes, so it was a bit hard to wake up here. <laughs> so I usually walk at six and eat at seven. This morning I walked at seven <laughs> and ate a little bit later. And Amelia and I, we found hills where we were and we did our high intensity running up the hills and recovery down the hills. Where did I get the energy? I hadn't had breakfast lead. I only ate lightly early yesterday. It's my glycogen stores. They're quick release glucose stores. They're just sitting in the muscle cell waiting to be called on. It's not a good time to exercise after you've eaten because where's all your body's energy going? Digestion. <laughs> One lady said, well, how am I going to have the energy to walk? I said, it's your glycogen stores. It is the diabetic's best kept secret. All you need to do is something to access that. And two things access it. Demand, which is exercise. And the other is water. Very important to be well hydrated. It helps your body access that. There's still glucose left over on a high carbohydrate diet. High carbohydrate diet means high glucose release. 
and only so much glycogen can be stored. And this glycogen that is in your muscle can only be used by your muscle. Your liver also stores some glycogen and that can be used all over the body. That's a good brain backup. So now, what is the liver going to do with the excess glucose? It stores it in the most amazing fuel depot in the human body. You may have heard of it. It's called fat cells. And in Australia and New Zealand today, on the high carbohydrate diet, what is happening to many? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the third place that your liver causes the glucose to be stored. The pancreas is the organ that we're going to be talking predominantly about. Here it is. And the pancreas lives under your left rib. And the pancreas releases insulin on demand. And so looking at this equation, high glucose demands high insulin. You see that? And one of the amazing things about these fat cells, they don't need insulin to get in and they don't need sodium. So when this cell starts to get a little bit weary, because you can imagine high carbohydrate, high glucose, high insulin, and the cell is getting so much insulin and it's already got its fuel, it's already got the stores, so something called insulin resistance steps in. You've heard of insulin resistance? It's almost as if the cell says, I'm sick of the side of you. I'm sick of the side of you. We've already got our fuel. We've already got our glycogen stores. So insulin resistance sets up in the cell. But there's another cell that says, just come right on in. No need for insulin, no need for sodium, just come right in. Who is that? That's the fat cell. So this cell, it needs insulin and it needs sodium. But this cell, it doesn't need any. So what's happening now is you've got insulin resistance. Insulin can't get that glucose in. The glucose is going round and round. Blood sugar levels remain high. Brain says, more insulin, more insulin, because the brain thinks, it's not getting in. We must need more insulin. And so what's happening here, we've got a problem. More high glucose, more insulin's released. The cell's saying, you're not coming in here. We've seen enough of you. So what's happening over here? Come on in, just, just come on in. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the pancreas just wears out and the pancreas just says, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And, the, and it becomes depleted, it becomes worn out. Do you know that uh, one diabetes mellitus means sweet urine? You see, there's just so much glucose running around, it can't go anywhere, and so what happens is the body starts to uh, urinate it out. Sweet union, urine, glucose in the urine. And one of the signs of diabetes is huge amounts of water. So the body starts saying, we've got to have more and more and more water, and, you, and the person actually starts um, getting very, very tired because <laughs> hardly anything's happening in here because of the insulin resistance they're set up. It's a terrible situation. The current figures are 400 diabetics diagnosed every week in Australia. That's alarming, isn't it? There was no diabetes until sugar was well established because what happens when sugar goes into the body, blood glucose levels rise dramatically. This is not a red pen, is it? <laughs> anyway, should be red. Blue blood, royal. <laughs> blood glucose levels rise dramatically. So very quickly the brain says, quick pancreas, release insulin. And because there was so much 
glucose, huge amounts of insulins are released and now blood glucose levels go down. Because remember what insulin does? It's the key that unlocks the door to get the glucose into the cell, into storage or over here as storage. And so because there was so much insulin released, blood glucose levels now are going too low. Now we've got another crisis. The cells are now starving because of the drop in fuel. And our brain, it consumes 15 times the fuel of any other cell. So brain starts to fade. This is called hypoglycemia, very low blood sugar. In fact, if it gets too low, the person can pass out. So very quickly, the brain says, pancreas, stop the insulin, quick, release glucagon. Now, glucagon is the other hormone that the pancreas makes, and it's designed to get the blood sugar level up again. But what does the person usually do down there? Have a lolly, have a biscuit, have a Mars bar, have a Coke, have a quick sweet, yeah? What happens then? Up again. What does the brain go? Oh no, now we're too high. Stop the glucagon, release the insulin. Oh no, now we're too low. Stop the insulin. Can you see what's happening? Up, down, up, down. It's called this biochemical whiplash. Up, down. How does the person feel up there? Spun up like a top. How does the person feel down there? Oh, they're passing out. A man said to me one day, Barbara, Barbara, he was a diabetic. He said, I had a diabetic crash on the bus today. I said, really, what time? Ah, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. I said, oh, what did you have for lunch? Why well, am I asking that? Because the last thing he ate is what's going to do it. <clears throat> he cleared his throat. He obviously didn't want to tell me. He said, ah, uh, two donuts and a can of Coke. I said, aha, <laughs> now I know what caused your crash. It went so high and it was so dangerous, that high, that the body reacted as in a crisis, releasing too much insulin and where did he go? <laughs> now if someone had a diabetic crash in front of me, I'd reach into their pocket, get the lolly or the sugar, put it into their mouth, it would save their life. As they came round, I would say to them, would you like me to show you how to prevent that ever happening again? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like the young man, Dan. He came to our health retreat two years ago. He's a type 1 diabetic. He'd had type 1 diabetes since he was 15. He got it from a very strong course of antibiotics. Some drugs have a side effect of killing off the beta cells in the pancreas. He came to our retreat, he's 20, he's a little overweight. Can you see why he's a little overweight? High insulin has it's a one set mind, I must store, I must store, I must store. Very difficult to lose weight when there's high insulin. He was with us for four weeks. He did two weeks on the program and he, did, and he helped in the garden for two weeks. First week, if he got a blood sugar level low in the middle of the night, he would wake up and he would take a lolly. He was a very quiet man. I didn't actually know it was happening, but we're not Starlick 13. We don't go through your bags. <laughs> he said it would always give him a headache because the blood sugar level would go bang. And he'd go back to sleep. Second week, he decided to try an apple. Now, in the middle of the night, it takes a long time to eat an apple. That would get his blood sugar level up, but he wouldn't get the headache. The third week, he tried something different. If he got a blood sugar level low in the middle of the night, he would jump out of bed and do 30 push-ups. Got his blood sugar level up again. Where did that come from? What happened when he did 30 push-ups? What did it access, students? His glycogen stores. Whew. He told me one morning that he got up and his blood glucose levels were three. Now three is nearly passing out. <laughs> he had a couple of big glasses of water, had a little bit of Celtic salt first. I'll talk about that in a minute. Helps to get the water inside the cell, all those minerals. Put his joggers on and went on a high intensity run. And I'll talk about that in a minute too. High intensity up the hill, 
slow down the hill, high intensity up the hill. That high intensity, what did it access? His glycogen stores. He came back, took his blood glucose levels, they were nine. From three to nine and he'd had nothing to eat. Now he's a very shy man and a very quiet man. By the third week he said to me, why hasn't anyone told me about glycogen? Mm-hmm. It's the best kept secret is these glycogen stores. Now we had a diabetic nurse doing our program and when she heard what he was doing she said this is very dangerous. He said is it? He said well if you think it's dangerous go running with an apple in your pocket. <laughs> mm-hmm. He was excited. So excited. He was accessing his glycogen stores but he was also eating a food program that was very low in carbohydrates. Way back in the 80s, Dr. Atkins showed this, showed this. In fact, Dr. Atkins, he did it for weight loss. He stopped the carbs to lose weight because he theorized if I stop the carbs and don't have the glucose coming in, my body will start to eat the fat stores. That was he theorized, he did it on himself and it worked. So what did he eat? You might not know what his full diet was. He ate a high fiber diet, three cups of vegetables a day with the exclusion of the potato. The wild yam uh, sweet potato, you called it kumara, is that how you say it? Kumara. It's, it's different to the potato. It has low glycemic index. We'll look at that in a minute. He ate a lot of fiber. He also ate a lot of protein. And this is one area of the Atkins diet that everyone talks about, is the high protein. And he was also eating quite generous amounts of fat. Now these three food groups keep the food in the stomach longer, so the person doesn't get hungry. Fibre keeps the food in the stomach longer because fibre binds up all the glucose and slowly releases it. And that's what the diabetic needs. Protein is the food that's broken down in the stomach. So when you have protein in your food, it keeps the food in the stomach longer. Fat keeps the food in the stomach longer because it coats the food. And that's very good news because it means you can go quite a distance between meals. And the fact is we have one stomach and one stomach only. And it averages, takes about three to four hours to digest a meal and then the stomach loves a one hour rest. Now the cows can eat all day because they've got about five stomachs, but not human beings. So Atkins found, and the paleo diet says much the same thing, the FODMAT diet says much the same thing. So there are many authors today who are doctors with decades of clinical practice up their sleeve who are basically saying the same thing. You see, these three food groups keep the food in the stomach longer, important point on a weight loss program. These three food groups also are the essential food groups. Why essential? Well, fibre is essential because fibre keeps that colon moving and it's pretty important that the plumbing's working well. Fibre stimulates movement in the colon. Fibre also sweeps the colon. And it's also in the fibre part of your food that you'll find a lot of your nutrients intensified. Now, I do not eat the skin of pineapples and oranges and mangoes and pawpaws. But when I was a little girl, mum peeled everything. But we don't peel a lot of things. We don't peel potatoes today, do we? I mostly don't peel cucumbers. I don't peel carrots. So that's what I mean by the skins and they're basically one of the highest fibre. Fibre is essential. Protein is essential. Yesterday we looked at the DNA. We looked at how the crosswood bands are made up of amino acid. The new cell is built up by amino acid, breakdown from the protein we eat. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is made up of protein. That's pretty important. In fact, once you take the water out, protein is the main substance that our body is made up of. Protein is essential. You cannot heal without protein. You cannot build new cells without protein. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. Except for the brain cell. 
the membrane around each cell in the brain is 70% fat. Did you know the brain is the fattiest organ in the body and the brain loves fat? Got that? Now there are fats and there are fats. <laughs> And the best fats are the fats that come from the hand of the Creator in your nuts and your seeds and your avocados and your coconuts. And the two concentrated fats that are the best fats are your coconut oil and your olive oil. Both oils have been used for centuries. And the cultures that use these oils always had fine health. Fat is an essential nutrient. Your sex hormones are made from fat. Your stress hormones are made from fat. It's pretty important. They're the three essential food groups. But what Atkins found in his research, and there are many today who are claiming the same thing, is that your non-essential food group is carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. Last year, Catalyst, August, you can go to iView and still see this, a show called Fat or Fiction, and there was a, a nutritionist, professor of nutritionist, he said, you can live very, very well without one dot of carbohydrates. Now let me very quickly um, get a balance on this. Carbohydrates are not bad, got that? They're not bad, it's only when they're overdone and refined. And you, can you see what most people are doing today? It's overdone, and in a lot of cases, it's refined. But I have even found people to overdo the unrefined. What a relief. My husband would never forgive me if there were no potatoes at their main meal. We love the carbs. They're only a problem if they're overdone and refined. So considering the three essential food groups and considering the non-essential food group, if someone wanted to lose weight quickly, what would they drastically drop? The carbs. If someone wanted to conquer diabetes quickly, what would they drastically drop? The carbs. The carbs. And very safely too. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. And it's not forever. Once you've conquered your diabetes, you can start to slip in a little bit more carbs. Once you've conquered your weight, you can start to slip in a little bit more carbs. I eat a very low carbohydrate diet. I'm not overweight. I don't, I'm not a diabetic. I just love it because I have so much energy. What's the old, say, old saying? If you're on a good thing, Stick to it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. It's old English. It means if it works, keep at it. One lady said, do you ever step sideways? I said, why would I? I enjoy so much what this does for me. Atkins, the FODMAT, Paleo diet, I'm sure we've all heard of it. There's even paleo restaurants today. They all advocate meat for protein, yep. And I'm a vegetarian. How can you do this on a vegetarian diet? To do it on a vegetarian diet, we need to have a look at vegetarian protein. And we're going to go to Genesis 129, where God tells Adam and Eve what to eat. So we're going to look at the food. We're going to look at the protein content and we're going to look at the carbohydrate content. Thank you. And God said to Adam and Eve, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth. What's a herb bearing seed? A herb bearing seed is a grain. So there's one. Another herb bearing seed is a legume. Another herb bearing seed is a seed. So what's the grain? Wheat, rye, barley, oats, amaranth, buckwheat, millet, quinoa, so many grains. They are high in protein and they are quite high in carbohydrates. How many on our carbohydrate list are from the grain? So cereal, bread, cakes, pie, pizza, pasta, rice, the majority are from the grain department. What's a legume? Lentils, chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans, cannelloni beans, kidney beans, soy, so many legumes. Legumes are high 
in protein and they are medium to low in carbohydrate. And you will find a lot of the low carb books advocate don't eat legumes because they have carbs. Well, they do, but not a lot. In, the fact is they have about a third the carbohydrate that you will find in the grain. What's a seed? Sesame seed, sunflower seed. Did you know that the sesame seed is phenomenally high in calcium? And a nice way to have that is tahini. My kids used to love tahini and honey on, on bread. You can make some beautiful dressings with tahini. A lot of Lebanese food uses tahini. Something like 1,400 milligrams of calcium in a cup. That's pretty phenomenal. Milk doesn't come anywhere near it. <laughs> Milk has calcium that can be accessed if you've got five stomachs. But we don't, do we? <laughs> the countries in this world with the highest incidence of osteoporosis are the highest consumers of cow's milk. Cow's milk's excellent milk for calves. Got that? But the milk you buy in the supermarket, which is homogenized and pasteurized, if that's given to a baby calf, that calf dies. Bit scary, isn't it? Pumpkin seed, did you know that pumpkin seed has something like 41 grams of protein to a cup? It's higher than any meats is the humble pumpkin seed. So pumpkin seed, sunflower seed, uh, chia seed, flax seed or linseed, these seeds are high in protein and they are low in carbohydrate. God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree. And the which of the tree is a fruit-bearing seed. What's a fruit-bearing seed? There's your nut. And there are so many nuts, aren't they? Cashews, uh, pecan nuts, walnuts, macadamia nuts, almonds, Brazil nuts. So many nuts. And nuts are high in protein and they are quite low in carbohydrate. So to ensure that you're getting the three essentials, my suggestion is increase the nut, seed, legume part of the meal. And to ensure you don't overdo the non-essential, decrease the nut. Sorry, decrease the grain part of the meal. That's an easy way to do it. Easy way. For lunch today, I had a big salad. I had a tahini salad dressing. I had some black-eyed beans with kale and zucchini, tomato and onion and fresh basil, delicious. And then we had fresh sweet corn. Now that meal, very low in carbohydrates. We ate about 2.30 or 3. It is now 7 o'clock, I have no hunger at all. And I know that that will take me all the way to bed. You can eat very well on a low carbohydrate meal. That meal was very high in fiber. Everything had fiber. That meal had generous amounts of protein. Oh, and I finished with a handful of walnuts. Very nice dessert. Generous amounts of fat. Fat in the walnut, fat in the avocado, fat in the tahini and olive oil dressing. Olive oil in the bean mix. It's a nice balance of it doesn't weigh you down. How many people feel like sleeping after lunch because they're just overloaded with the carbs? That's an easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. I think I need metho on this. It's not behaving. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You will find that most of the health professionals today are saying what I'm saying. And the paleo diet, the FODMAT diet, Atkins diet, also Bruce Fife in his book, they are advocating exactly what I'm saying. Now these doctors have decades of clinical practice up their sleeve, but something else has come into the equation because Aussies and New Zealanders have been eating sugar for a long, long time. What else has come into the equation is a grain that you will find 
if you wouldn't mind working away at that, you will find most cereals are made out of this grain. You will find most breads are made out of this grain. Most cakes are made out of this grain. Pies and pizza are made out of this grain. Pasta is made out of this grain. So all from here. They are all made out of that grain. Can anyone guess what it is? It's wheat. It's wheat. One man said to me, but Barbara, God made wheat. I said, he did, but not this one. One lady said to me, but the Bible talks about, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Bread is the staff of life. I said, it was in Jesus' day, but it is not anymore. Let me give you the wheat story. In the 1950s, a group of scientists in Mexico put wheat through intensive crossbreeding. And this intensive crossbreeding produced a wheat with a high yield. Now, they did it to save the starvation crisis. Now, I don't know if you remember, if you say my era, when I was a little girl, wheat grew this high. And if you go and look at wheat today, do you know how high it grows? Only that high. Maybe they don't grow a lot of wheat in New Zealand. In Australia, the big wheat grows. You see, at first, with the high yield, the stalk would break because it had such a heavy yield. So they went back, back to the drawing board and they came up with a, a plant that only grew this high, had a very thick stem and it could hold the high yield. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a wheat farmer do our program. He said, you're right, my brother and I are wheat farmers. We have been for many years. He said, sometimes we get tenfold more grain per acre. Can you see why the farmers love it? And so, it was in about the 1970s that this wheat went worldwide. In 1969, Dr. Norman Bulag got a Nobel Prize for his hybridised wheat. So by the 1990s, in Australia, in New Zealand, every cereal, every bread, every cake, every pie, every pizza, every donut, every biscuit, every pasta, what's it made out of? the hybridised wheat. Now what happened with this hybridised wheat? I'll just wipe that off. What happened with this hybridised wheat? What was never addressed was the effect on the human body, the effect on the gut. And what this hybridised wheat produced was a type of starch. It's called amylopectin. Amylopectin A is the starch found in this hybridised wheat. Now, amylopectin A gets the blood sugar level up very high, very fast, and you have always get a corresponding dump. Amylopectin B is what's found in bananas and potatoes. And amylopectin B, it gets it up fairly high, not as high, and so you get a drop too, but not as low. You see that? Amylopectin C is what is found in chickpeas, lima beans, legumes, and it gets a nice steady rise and steady drop. Now because of that amylopectin A, it has a very high reading on the glycemic index. Are you familiar with the glycemic index? Because the glycemic index of foods is how quickly the food breaks down to glucose in the blood. Mm -hmm. So your baseline for glycemic index is 55. So anything below 55 is low. Anything above 55 is high. Let me give you an illustration. Cherries are 26. In fact, in most of the low-carb books, they advocate the only fruit to eat is blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, cherries, because they're very low on the glycemic index. Sugar, whether it be molasses, whether it be brown, whether it be raw, whether it be white, it has a glycemic index of 59, and we're not surprised. The ref the re Refined wheat, so that would be white bread, white cereals, cakes made out of white flour, 69. Wow. So that white, white bread products is higher than sugar? I'm glad you're sitting down because the next information is shocking. 
whole meal. So whole meal wheat. So that's whole meal bread, whole meal pasta, 72. How could that be? How could whole meal bread get the blood sugar level up quicker and higher than white bread? Well, because it's not refined, it has more of the amylopectin A in it. Can you see that? One lady said, are you saying white bread's better than whole milk? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. The problem is the wheat. Mm -hmm. I presented this one day at our health retreat and a lady began to cry. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm type 2 diabetic. I was diagnosed two years ago. She said, I do everything they tell me. I have wholemeal bread, wholemeal cereal, wholemeal pasta. And every six months I visit the doctor and he puts me on more insulin. What's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results. She said, I'm crying tears of frustration because I do everything that they tell me and I'm getting worse. She said, I'm crying tears of joy right now because you have just solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to pursue this a little bit more, there's a book called Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis. And he will explain this issue in detail. Why is his book called Wheat Belly? Because this blood sugar level up that goes up so high under the effect of the amylopectin A in this hybridized wheat, very quickly the body's got to do something with that. And what does it do with it? Stores it as fat. He said this amylopectin A, once the blood sugar drops because of the high insulin resist, it gets stored on the internal organs pushing the belly out. But not only that, it's a type of visceral fat that gets stored on the belly. So you've got a double whammy of pushing it out. In his book, Wheat Belly, Dr. William Davis must say the term wheat belly nearly every page. He has decades of clinical practice up his sleeve. Hundreds of his patients have conquered diabetes and weight gain through dropping of the wheat. Is it that simple? Well, it's part of, it's part of the equation. <laughs> but it solves the puzzle. Because Aussies, New Zealanders have been eating sugar for a long time, and sugar doesn't get off the hook. <laughs> sugar certainly is a big contributing factor. But something has caused this explosion. And it is the hybridized wheat. There is also a problem with the gluten because it's produced an incredibly complex gluten. No wonder we have so much gluten intolerance today. You look at the, you look at the timeline worldwide in the 70s, by the 1990s, all of those foods are made out of this hybridized wheat. When did gluten intolerance appear? <laughs> going into the 2000s, when Aussies are starting to actually show the results of this, of this wheat. But you've not only got that, you've got the problem of babies being fed starch too young before they've got their molars to be able to deal with it. Do you know a hundred years ago, babies weren't given food? And the first teeth are four at the top, four at the bottom, and they're called milk teeth, because that's all babies should have, milk. Then the molars appear where they grind. And when the grinding molars come through, then tylen is released in the mouth. And tylen is the amylase enzyme that breaks down starch. So with my babies, I gave them no starch until the molars were through. That can be 20 months, even to two years. And what are mothers told to give their babies in the first four, six months of life? Farax, yeah, pure starch. That's setting up the gluten intolerance. It's setting up gut problems. We're going to go back to the old ways. <laughs> so many little bits and pieces come together to make us who we are. But the good news is we, we live in an incredible body 
that has an amazing ability to heal itself when you give it the right conditions. Last night I told you the story of a couple of people who'd conquered their eczema by stopping the wheat. Conquering irritable bowel by stopping the wheat. So many symptoms. I could have an answering service on my phone. Stop the wheat, dairy, refined sugar. Next, stop the wheat, dairy. Is it that simple? Well, it's not quite that simple, but it is a large part of it. You can eat a slice of bread and it'll be out of your body in 24 hours, but the effect can remain for up to six weeks, two months. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, well, I've been doing it for six weeks and I'm not getting the results, they might say, well, do you have any mold exposure or chemical exposure? They can be exasperating the problem. That's why the detective hat always must go on to find out why these things are so. Newton's third law of motion, to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Now to allow you to die, fully digest what I've just presented, because to some it may be quite shocking news, it was certainly quite shocking news when I first looked at it. But I've seen such amazing results and the books that I've quoted, there's Gut and Psychology by Dr. Natasha, Sam, by not, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, there's also um, Stop Autism Now and Stop Alzheimer's Now by Dr. Bruce Fife. There's Grain Brain by Dr. David Pertmuller and William Davis's book uh, uh, Wheat Belly. They are all basically saying the same thing. And what does the proverb say? In a multitude of counsellors, there's safety. And these people are all coming to the same conclusions and we find too in our health centre. Yes? Where does spelt flour come in? Spelt is a wild or field hybrid from the original wheat grain. So spelt and kamut. I'll write them up here for you. Spelt. One lady said, how do you spell it? Spelt and kamut. They are wild or field hybrids of the original wheat. They don't have the amylopectin A and they do not have the complex protein structure. If someone is celiac, often they can't even handle that. They have to heal that gut first. But even people who are sensitive or intolerant to wheat can usually handle these two. I'm going to give everyone a break now. It is almost five to eight. If you could please come back at five past eight, that's a ten minute break, um, we will continue our presentation. And out the back here there are glasses of, there's big jugs of water with um, lemon and mint in it and Amelia, here's Amelia, she will be manning the books and the DVDs out the back. But there's one more question there I'll answer before I go, but the lady's not looking at me. Yes? You had a question. That's a good question and I'll, I'll cover that in our next session. Thank you. Have a good break. Oh, there's one more question, yes? Uh, you can get it as spelt and kamut. The original wheat was called enkhorn, which is almost impossible to get now. But these two have uh, wild hybrids from the Emma wheat. So you can put these names into the web and you might find them somewhere. But the Spelt and Kamut are quite easy to get. And again, they're, they're wild or field hybrids of these original grains. So they're very similar. Have a nice break. See you at five past eight. <laughs>